Hello, everybody. Look, look, look who's our guest. So anyway. <laughs> Don't look. Don't look. Let me go get my mask on. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so my name is Donya Williams. Hi, everyone. This is Brian. And here she is, the legend, dairy activist. Miss Jane Elliott. I'm so excited. Well, so we'll happy. See. I had this whole thing set up to just say this stuff about you and it just whoop, went straight out of my head. <laughs> and that is such a good idea. <laughs> I do <had to> <laughs> know, but you know, you this is the woman who was um responsible for the blue eye, brown eye exper no, not experience. Oh. Exper it's not experiment. That's not experiment. You're right. Exercise or experience. Exercise. But right. not, it's not, not experiment. experiment. And um, she was a teacher. And, you know, most people know her as the watching this particular show on Frontline when she did her exercise with the third grade students. So welcome, Miss Jane. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. Yes. Yes. Brian, you want to say something? Welcome to the show. <clears throat> As we were on saying off camera, um, I've been following your work for a long time. Saw you for the saw you for the first time when I was living in England, um, and that whole documentary just just kind of blew me away because it was just such a simple but effective and innovative way of actually talking about race, racial differences, how people treat each other, but specifically how Americans treat each other. And um, I just found it an, um, an amazing program to watch. So I'm gonna give myself a little plug. So I hope everyone doesn't mind. Just to say again that my genealogy, my 50, 50 practical steps to genealogy is officially released. It's available on all big, you know, all of the big good online, thank you, Danya, bookstores. When bookstores are open, you'll be able to go into the books, bookshops and be able to buy it. They could probably uh, send for it now, couldn't they? Yes, yes, you can order it online. So everyone who has ordered, thank you very much, because that book is the number one new genealogical release on Amazon. So yes. thank, you, thank you, everyone. We are very excited to see that. I'm so proud. I can't express to you how proud I am of you, Brian. And again, like I said, everything just kind of flew out the window. I, I was supposed to say that too. And it just all just left me when she came back to the show. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I started watching you because of my, my research, to be honest with you. My research introduced me to so much different stuff. My genealogical research it introduced me to so much different things like racism, specifically racism. And so in doing the search for genealogy and looking at the racism, you started to pop up. And I started to get information and came across this brown eye, blue eye, blue eye, brown eye project. Um, and I'm like, oh my God. And it actually helped me go into, into my research with open eyes and understanding that I'm going to find certain things. I'm going to have to deal with certain things. And I swear, I don't know what I would have done without it because we still deal with stuff today with our research that um, where we have, European Americans who don't like the fact that we're related to them, so they shut our their trees down and we can't do any research with them or they don't call us back or it's, it's just a lot. And we didn't really get a chance, to, um, Jane, to talk about this while we were off camera, but the whole reason why I was living in England at all, and I lived there for 30, for 30 years, was because of racism. I had, I'd had enough of it for the first 22 years of my life in this country. And it's not to say that the United Kingdom is some racial utopia because it has its own issues, even though they're nowhere on par as what they are in this country. But that was the whole reason why I left. I, I always grew up feeling like this, was, this wasn't my country. I was born here. I lived here for 22 years before living abroad, but I just, I never seemed to get that invitation in the mail that America was my country because of the color of my skin. And that really, you know, the, all of the things that got brought out during the, you know, the video clips that I've seen where, you know, you give this exercise over and over again. 
I just keep seeing it again and again and again. One of the most poignant moments that we did talk about was one of the young women who left, who, who left the exercise, I've had enough, I can't, you know, I can't deal with it. And you can see she's getting really frustrated. There was another young woman who started crying as well. And I was thinking, we as, as a people, black and brown skinned people don't have that luxury. You pointed that out. You're like, you can actually get up out of your seat and leave. And then you pointed to one of the, the black participants. They, they don't have that luxury, you pointed yeah. out. And Donnie and I were even speaking about how black and brown people in this country were not even allowed to express, I guess I'm going to call it negative emotions, like anger or frustration or resentment or cry. Because then it's like, oh, you're playing the black card. Now you're, now you're getting all emotional. Um, people constantly accuse people of color of playing the race card. What they don't realize is with the, there isn't a card in the American deck that isn't the race card. Hmm. There isn't one area of living in the United States of America that isn't affected by the ignorance of racism. Our number, as far as, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have interrupted you, but we, we have to realize that the number one problem in the United States today is racism. Mm -hmm. And racism is built on a lie. There are books out there written called The Myth of Race. It is a myth. It's a lie that was deliberately constructed during the Pan Spanish Inquisition to give those members of Torquemada's group a, a justification for killing people. They were killing people who weren't Christians, found out they had killed a whole, probably a couple thousand Christians before they realized you can't tell what a person's religion is by looking at them. So they decided they'd have to find a way to de decide who to kill, and they'd have, it would be a physical difference, and they settled on skin color. It makes no sense. It didn't make sense then, and it doesn't make sense now, unless you're a pale face and your power is based on the amount of melanin in your skin. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're basing our self-image on in this country, is mm -hmm. the amount of melanin in our skin. Mm -hmm. It makes no mm -hmm. sense. Never has, mm -hmm. never will. Yeah. And the irony of it is, you know, because Donnie and I, we've been researching our family for a very long time, and the fact that I can take my ancestry back to colonial Virginia on the Native American side, the European side, and the first Africans that ever landed in Virginia. And that ancestry, the only ancestry that's, that anyone seems to value is the European one. The, you know, try, the, the African just makes them uncomfortable and they don't really want to talk about it or acknowledge it. And we can't, we, we still can't even agree on what that what those first Africans were. They were bonded servants, but people still in call, still insist on calling them slaves. Um, and it's just it's just a mess. But the first question I have for you was you did this wonderful explanation. It was the 1950s. Your father had a family store. He hired a black man. Um, and he paid a heavy price for that. No, and that was my husband. That was my husband. husband. Okay. who was working for the National Tea Company. And he was the store was in the north end of Waterloo, Iowa, which was the black section. He was allowed to hire one black man, one black person in that store. That's all. And his black, his black uh, employee, Jim Jackson, quit and went to college. So Daryl was without a black employee. So the head of the NAACP in Waterloo came to the store and said, Daryl, I'm going, we're going to pick at your store. And he said, why would you do that? She said, you don't have a black employee. He said, bring me a black employee. I want one. I want, I'm only allowed to hire one. Bring me one. She said, we don't want to bring you one. We want to pick at your store because you don't have any black employees in the black section of town. So they picketed my husband's store. Mm. The, the store was, he was running the store, but the owners of the store were in Chicago. And that's the National Tea Company. It was it was a most ex interesting experience and the reason we left Waterloo because we knew that there were going to be race riots and Daryl's friends, the majority of Daryl's friends were people who came to the store as customers and he didn't want to have to be a, an enemy of the people who he had become good friends with. So we moved out of Waterloo to avoid a race, to avoid the race, realize the race war that did start. And it was, it was ugly and we thought it would end. It hasn't ended. My God. There are still places in Waterloo where you dare not walk, you dare not ride your bicycle, and you dare not try to buy a house. So my question is, 
I guess what is what was it? Um, I guess in your background and your husband's background that. I guess, for lack of a better word, kind of made you really kind of early social justice, um, social justice advocates. Yeah, I had a father who said, "A fair thing is a pretty thing, and a right wrongs no man." He'd say, "If it's right, it might impoverish you, it might inconvenience you, but it won't wrong you." You know the difference between right and wrong. Now do the right thing, goddammit. <laughs> he always followed. He always <laughs> left it with a goddammit, and and he said, "You don't judge a book by its cover." And he said, you don't judge a man until you have lived his life. He used to tell us about his cousin who had a fabulous still during Prohibition. And he would tell us about that still and about the, how, how interesting it was when the revenuers came out to try to find the still. And I said to him, after our kids were, after we had children, I said, Dad, you told us never to commit a crime. Those people were committing a crime. And he gave me that Lloyd Jennison look and said, have you ever watched your children starve to death? Mm. You will do what you have to do during the Depression and following the Depression to see to it that your children don't starve to death. My husband and I would not stay in Waterloo, even if we didn't have as much money, and, and bow to those who said, you can only hire one black person. We wouldn't do that. I couldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. And because of what my, set, my father told me, I wouldn't do that. There are things I will not go along with. I won't go along to get along, which is <laughs> which ah, causes right. me lots of <laughs> lots of unpleasantness. I've been I've been threatened with death numerous times. I've been hit by a white male. I've been run out of Uniontown, Pennsylvania, at midnight by three carloads of blacks because I did the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise with a group of teachers in the morning, and the superintendent got numerous calls saying, "If you don't get that bitch out of town, we're going to shoot her." So they got me out of town the next day. It was an interesting experience. You don't dare stand up, even if you're a white woman, you don't dare stand up in a situation like that and say, what you're doing is wrong, people. It's time to put a stop to it. So I'm curious about what is it that you think made you and perhaps your father, um, I don't want to say nonconformist, but because a lot of people were indifferent. I'm not going to say that, you know, they may have had their views about race, but I get the kind of feeling, especially doing research and having spoken to my parents, well, that's just black people's problem. That's not my problem. I can work, get paid, look after my family. I've never know I've never know I've never met a black woman, a black mother, who was indifferent to racism. I've never met one of those. They probably are out there, but I've never met one. Every one of them, particularly those who have sons have to be very aware of racism, have to be very, very capable of coping with it, have to develop coping skills that I, as a white woman, have never had to develop. I've never met a black woman who was comfortable in the situation that we have going on in this country. And I will never forget the black woman that stood beside me at the University of Indiana, Indiana several, a couple, two years ago, and we were talking about differences. And I asked the audience, and the audience was composed of, for the love of heaven, department heads and administrators, 250 of them. And I said to, said to that group of people, you, what differences? We're going to talk about differences. And one woman had said, why do we have to talk about differences? Uh, similarities are more important than differences. Let's talk about our similarities. I said, let me show you why we have to talk about differences. So I had a tall white male come up and stand on my left and an even taller black female come up and stand on my right. I said, now, you folks see any differences here? And I was praying that they wouldn't flunk this test. It is a simple test. All you have to do is say one word. And so the first word they said was height. And I said, well, you flunked the test, didn't you? And they couldn't understand that at all. So I asked the tall white man if his height was important to him. No. I said, does it give you power? Well, yes. Is it a gift? Well, no. What, were you just born with a tall gene? Yes, I have. And it gives you power. Well, yes, it does. I talked, asked the black woman the same thing. She said, well, there are other issues to discuss. And I said, we're going to discuss them. So we went through the tall thing. And her height didn't give her power, even though she was taller than he was. So I said, do you see any other differences here? So they said gender. So we went through that. I said, do you see any other differences? Age. So we went through that. And this black woman was getting more and more agitated. And she was standing like, how long is it going to take these people who tell me they don't see color to say something intelligent here. Mm -hmm. And I finally said, yeah, yeah, this is what was going on in her head. And I knew what was going on in hers because I knew what was going on in mine. And I finally said, now, do you see any other differences here, people? 
And finally, somebody in that group said color. I said, thank you very much. You're the first person in the world years that I've been doing this who said color. But now, are you talking about hair color or skin color? She said skin color. And I said to the white male, is your skin color important to you? I never have to think about it. I thought, oh, you simpleton. You are an educator. You should never have said that. I said, is it a gift? He said, I, I, I said, does it give you power? Yes. Are you afraid of anything? I'm not afraid of anything. So I turned to the black woman. At that point, she was just standing there with one tear sliding slowly down the left side of her face. And I said, is your color important to you? She said, she waited a long time. And then she said, I'm going to say something I've never said out loud before. And I said, and that's because, she said, because I'm ashamed of it. I said, and that is, she said, I'm a mother. I have two daughters. God, it made me sick. She said, both times when I was pregnant, I prayed that I wouldn't have a son. I said, and that's because, she said, because I didn't want to think about what he'd have to go through and what I'd have to go through when I lost him. There wasn't a dry eye in that house. The only sound in that room, the only sound you heard was this white man going, <clears throat> and I thought, cry, you miserable SOB. How dare you? How dare you say there's nothing that you're afraid of and you never have to think about the color of your skin. And I said to that audience, that woman just taught you more in three sentences than I could teach you in a lifetime. And I looked at this tall white male and he shrunk about five inches during that experience. He exposed himself. That's called indecent exposure. When you say something that ugly and you have the power to say that in that group of so-called educators, I was absolutely, totally disgusted with the whole group. And I said to them, look, people, the next time you say this, the Pledge of Allegiance, the flag with liberty and justice for all, the next time you sing the Star Spangled Banner, oh, say, does that Star Spangled Banner yet wave? or the land of the free, and I pointed at the white man on my left, and the home of the brave, and I pointed at the black woman, because that's what it's all about. We are living in the land of the free, and I'm free, and black women have to be brave. I don't have to be brave, and what I do doesn't take any courage. It takes determination to end this mess. And if, if my white skin, so-called white skin, gives me the power to go out and say it, I'm going to say it. You don't like it? You better get used to it or keep or stay away from me. So people stay away from me in droves. Well, um, well now that I, you know, had to get myself together <laughs> because everything that you just said is very true. Being a mother of four, three of which are boys and um, or excuse me, men, one of which is autistic. So he doesn't even know what he's going to walk out into. And, and I can remember when he, once we found out, as far as he was concerned, once we found out that he was autistic, the first thought that passed through my head was, oh my God, I'm going to have to live the rest of my life to protect him. Yeah. So I, I got like, I had, I don't know if you saw it, but I was in here wiping my face <laughs> because you hit the nail on the head. That is just like the biggest fear for, I think, for African-American women um, is the fear for their sons. And uh, not just looking at the way things are today, it's not just our sons. It's also now fear for our daughters because they're getting snatched up. They're getting stuff is happening with them as well. And my daughter who you met is a very political young lady who's very knowledgeable of her rights and everything that's supposed to happen. So if she steps out there and they come at her a certain way, she's not going to take, she's not going to take it. And she's going to get either beaten or killed. See? That's well, I'm sorry, but that's the that's the climate in which we're living today. Well, again, this... our president, so-called president, is encouraging people in those attitudes and in those behaviors. We are allowing things to happen today that would never have happened after the after the 70s. In the 70s and 80s, this kind of thing was getting better. I thought we were on our way to curing this with this disease. It isn't a disease. I thought we were on our way to realizing the lie and refusing to tolerate it. But you see, in this country, the word tolerate means put up with. In the dictionary, it means 
recognize, appreciate, and value. Hmm. But we tolerate zits when we're young and hot flashes when we're old. And we tolerate the flu in between. We tolerate ugly things that are going to go away. I don't believe in tolerance. I believe in accepting, appreciating, and recognizing. But that is not what we teach in the schools in this country. We teach tolerance, put up with it. No, we have to stop that. I'm, I'm opposed to teaching tolerance. But it's better than teaching hatred. But there's another side to tolerance, which says people who have power can decide who to tolerate. Mm. People without power have to wait to be tolerated. Mm -hmm. So let's get over that. I'm sorry. I just want to jump in on the other slide as you were, you were speaking about black sons. So again, for me, um, I, I don't think I've ever disclosed this publicly. I, when I was, again, living in England, uh, I spent eight years doing intensive counsel mental counseling sessions. Um, I had anger management issues. I wasn't really entirely sure what that was all about. And when I found the right therapist to work with, we started, it was like an onion, and we started right. peeling off the layers. And I realized I've been carrying around 22 years of pent of just internalized rage, frustration, bitterness, resentment, and it was really bleeding into other areas of my life. It was affecting you know, personal relationships and, and other kinds of relationships. And I just wanna say, whether you're a black male or a black female, do not be ashamed of getting counseling. Do not and be do not, and do not be ashamed of being angry. Yes. And do not blame your anger on the color of your skin. And do not blame your anger on your race. You're a member of you are one of my cousins, a member of my 30th to 50th cousins. And the anger that you are experiencing is because of ignorant people's reaction to your skin color. It has nothing to do with your worth as a human being. And you have to know that. But we start preschool. It used to be we'd start with you when you were five years old. That then, but then I believe it was Richard Nixon who said, give me a child from the ages of three to five and he'll be mine for a lifetime. So then we started early childhood ed. So that means that now instead of having 13 years to, to indoctrinate people into the myth of the rightness of whiteness, we now have six, 15 or 16 years. It takes that long to convince a human being that some of us are less than human and others are more human because of the absence of a chemical in our skin. Do we not realize how, the, what, how much anger we cause in other people with this ignorance? And then if you're angry, it's because you're a black man. It's not because you have been disowned and distreated and disabused because of somebody else's ignorance. It's because you're reacting to the color of your skin. I'm not, you are. It's all That's your fault. But that's actually encoded in our language because white men can be assertive. Black, well, actually, I'm going to say white men and women can be assertive. Black men and women, if we try to be assertive, we're called aggressive. Absolutely. Or angry. Or or angry. Men, men or can be, men can called be called aggressive. Angry. Women have to be assertive. Men can be aggressive. That's a male thing. Women have to be assertive. <laughs> and white yeah. women can get in this in can live in the reflection of a white male's glory and then can be just as aggressive as the males are. Make no mistake about that. I know how that works. And I use it to my advantage when I do the exercise, because in order to do the exercise and have to make and make it work, I say to the people who are going through it, to the blue eyed, to the brown eyed people who are on top always the first time. And I only, and with grown ups, I only do it at one time only brown eyed people are on top. I say to that group, all you have to do is act white. And every person of color and every white male and every white female in that room knows exactly what they have to do. All yeah. they have to do is act white. Well, it's funny you should say that because I was born in Connecticut. So I grew up in a fairly, you know, a, a moderate, moderately affluent town that was about 99% um, non-ethnic. So about 99% white. And what I felt that I had, so basically I tried to assimilate. That was my, that was like my safety strategy was to assimilate. So there's me running around wearing stuff I would never normally wear, like deck shoes. I think right. like duck, duck boots, those weird little New England pl plastic shoes that they wear. Um, <laughs> just all that kind of stuff. Looking right. like 
looking like a little preppy, which was not me. And that it still didn't work. I was still called the N word. I still had stuff thrown at me. I was still getting into fights. And that's because by the time I got to 22, I'm like, look, I can't win. So I'm off. Mm. Well, uh, people call me an people call me the N word, uh, an N word lover. And I say, thank you very much. I'd rather be a lover than a hater any day. Thank you for calling me an N word lover. And then they don't know how to respond to that. What that says is their hatred is an absolute opposition to what I believe. Okay. Donnie, I've got one question, and then I promise you can jump in. It's just because Jane said the, the perfect thing to set this question up. You do a wonderful job explaining how kind of white reactions to this whole subject matter is like the five stages of grief. And I was just hoping right. for, for our audience, you could explain what the five stages of grief are and why there's a similarity. Now I have to think what they are. Denial. First, mm -hmm. we deny that we have the problem. Anger. Then we begin to bargain. Then we become, become depressed. And then we accept the situation. Yeah. That's what I did when my husband died. First, I denied that he was dying. Then I was angry because he dared to leave me after he said he wouldn't, and he did. And I had to bargain with, with myself and with whatever causes these things. And then finally, I... I, didn't, I never went into depression because I didn't have time because I was working. And now I have accepted that almost. But, but giving up the rightness of whiteness is like going through the five stages of grief. Mm. First, we have to deny that we, have any, that we are racist. Then we, have to, then we have to get angry because you called me a racist and I'm not a racist. Some of my best friends are black. Or the woman who says, when I see people, I don't see people as black or brown or red or yellow. I just see people as people, but never puts the word white in there. But that's how she expresses her anger. Then they get depressed. Well, what am I, what, what can I do? And they try to make friends of some person of color, the nearest person of color they can find, maybe the last one they mistreated. And then they get depressed about the whole thing. And finally, when none of that works, they finally accept it grudgingly. And some of them never do get to acceptance. Some white people will not get to the acceptance of the fact that this is so, a so-called Christian nation and deny the part of the Bible where it says Jesus had kinky woolly hair and feet of bronze and deny the part where it talks about the family of man and deny the part where it says judge not that ye be not judged and absolutely refuse to admit that in so much as ye have done it unto one of these, my brethren, so have ye done it unto me. And now, where Muslims are concerned, we are ever more determined not to allow those people to mess up our faith. If the whole thing is based on a lie, it's only been around for about 550 years, we could destroy it. I know that we could destroy it in one generation. If we would hire educators, and I'm not talking about teachers, there's a big difference between a teacher and an educator. Teachers dispense facts and figures to get kids ready for the end of year testing. And edu the word educator comes from the root duck deuce, which means lead, the prefix e, which means out, the suffix ate, which means the act of, and the suffix or, which means one who does. An educator is one who leads people out of the ignorance of racism. It, an educator is attempting to lead people out of where they are. We don't do that with racism in this country. We teach racism on a daily basis and if you don't believe it I, I don't have it in my hand but get a copy of the peter's projection map write that down peter's projection map you have it on tape now but everybody needs to see the peter's projection map because in the 1600s the pope commissioned uh mercator to make a map that showed the spread of christianity we have been using that map ever since to teach students of all ages about the size, the shape, location, importance of the land masses on the face of the earth. Until you have seen the Peter's projection map, you won't realize how beastly that whole thing is. And that map, the equator, according to your social studies type teacher, what is the equator? What's the equator, people? It's the line that that separates from the north to the south and the south north pole and the south pole right north northern hemisphere and southern yeah. hemisphere right because right. hemi is a prefix that means half well if you look at the mercator map you'll quickly realize that the equator is two-thirds of the way down the map 
<laughs> it doesn't yeah, it doesn't separate the map into two equal pieces. It separates it into the north northern heart and the bottom half. The northern part, which is mostly Christian at, at that time. You need to be aware of those differences. And at the bottom of that Mercator map, on the land, legend, it says, and get a picture of the Mercator map in your mind. You see Greenland hanging down there like a great big ripe plum in the middle of that map? Mm-hmm. At the bottom of the map, it says, in the legend... South America is actually nine times larger than Greenland. Nine times larger than Greenland? Now, if you didn't know that, you probably are a college graduate. Greenland, South America, in fact, is nine times larger than Greenland. Now, think about that. Our Greenland is huge. This is not the northern hemisphere. If you didn't know those things, and you don't know those things because you're a college graduate, you weren't in you weren't you weren't encouraged to, or even you nobody demanded that you earn that. You need to know that. People need to know that. That's just so, one of the ways in which we teach the lie of racism. So the things that you're saying right now really like reverts back to all of the stuff that we had to learn when we were researching where our families were from. You, yes. You've given me a great um, segue into what I wanted to talk about, which is education and learning and things of that nature. Um, one of the things, Brian and I's family comes from Edgefield, South Carolina, and we've realized in, in doing our research, Edgefield plays a huge part in the creation of America after the Civil War. Right. right. So, so you have the American Revolution and you go through whatever, you go through all of the different wars in between, but then you have that Civil War. And when you have that Civil War, whether people want to accept or re- realize or believe it or not, America was reinventing this, itself after the Civil War so that it could become what it quote unquote is today. And But, and that, but let, me, let me stop you there. Okay. We refer to this country as America. America is everything from the northernmost point of Canada to the southernmost point of South America. All of those countries are part of America. Exactly. But we, in our arrogance, call these 48 contiguous states, Alaska and Hawaii, and the islands, America. Mm. It isn't America. It is the United States of America. We, right. That's one of the things that we need to fix, but we won't fix it because this is tradition. People, you and I know that slavery was tradition. We have tried to get rid of that. We haven't gotten it accomplished yet, but we're working at it in this country. We need to get rid of the myth of America being only those 48 contiguous states. Okay, go on. So, so the thing that I'm trying to get into when you say that is the fact that um, I believe that the education that's in the history books today suck. And one of the things that Brian and I, well, definitely, I know that Brian and I both, you know, believe is that if genealogy was brought in to the educational system, a lot of things that you're talking about would actually end up being taught. Because I can honestly sit here and say to you that everything that I know now, as far as this history is concerned, I was not taught it in school, but I always knew and remember in sitting in my history classes that there was something missing, that it wasn't completely right, that there was it just it just wasn't right. So my question to you is, is how do you think we could push something like that to maybe get a course that will allow this type of teaching because genealogy is totally different from American history or this history that is being taught, but yet it still gives a a version of it. It gives the true version of it. We don't teach history in schools in this country. We teach hysteria. We teach hysteria. Okay. We teach people to love those who look like themselves if they're pale faces and to hate those who aren't, to think themselves better because of the lack of the chemical in their skin. You have to, if you're going to, if you can talk about genealogy until hell freezes over, but what you had better do is get Anthony Browder's book and the things that he has written. And it, the first, the one I've read and think is absolutely beautiful is his book, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. Have you read it? 
No, but I'm I'm writing it down. You <laughs> absolutely must get Anthony Browder's book, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. Four thousand years before the Jesus before the birth of Jesus Christ. That's black history. You don't start black history with slavery. You start black history back. 4,000 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Then when you're trying to have Black History Month, you'll have to have Black History Year. <laughs> if you're really going to teach Black History, if you're going to teach all of it, you'd better teach all of it, and you'd better not start it with slavery. If people today realized that the first modern human beings that evolved on this earth were Black people, they evolved in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, you will know all this, but I don't think your listeners do. Because if they if they graduate, as people say to me, I'm not a racist, and I say to them, did you graduate from high school? Well, yes. If you graduated from high school and you aren't a racist, you have to go back and take the, pro the whole program over because you didn't learn what you were supposed to learn. You were supposed to learn about the wonderful things that white people have done to help black and brown and yellow and red people become civilized. And the way we do that is kill those who don't agree with us. Make no mistake about this. I know what is taught in history. I've been there, done that. But you have to read that book because 4,000 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, black people in the Nile Valley and the Nile and people are going to say Nile Valley is in Africa. Yeah, Nile Valley is in Egypt and Egypt is in Africa. In Af That's Get right. That into your head, folks, because <laughs> so they, were doing, right. they were doing cataract surgery with metal instruments before there was such a thing ever heard of in the UK or in Europe. We don't have any idea. If you had any idea how brilliant, how creative, how courageous, how curious, how inventive those first black human beings were, that they could leave the area of the equator and populate every landmass on the face of the earth. Now somebody's going to say, well, I'm, I didn't come from black people. I'm white. Wait a minute. The only reason there are so-called white people on this earth is because when, they, when human beings evolved in Africa, they, their bodies produced a lot of melanin to protect their cells from the damaging rays of the sun. As people moved, those black people moved farther and farther from the equator, their bodies produced less and less melanin. So their skin, their hair, and their eyes got lighter. Their brains didn't get smaller, but their skin, their hair, and their eyes got lighter. And as they moved into the Middle East and Far East, they were exposed to less sunlight. But also, in the Far East, the reason people have a different slant to their eyes is because of the different angle at which the rays of the sun strike the Earth. Now, scientists have come up with that. Anthropologists know that. They haven't made that information available to most of us because they get paid for writing books, textbooks, that will promote the popular idea of the popularity of the rightness of whiteness. You can't sell a textbook that tells the truth in the land of the free and the home of the brave. You have to sell, if you're going to sell a textbook, you have to sell one that parents will allow their children to read. When I was a freshman in college, in a social studies, elementary social studies class, our professor said, if you are teaching in a racist community, you must not teach in opposition to the local mores. The people who are paying your wages through their taxes have the right to have their children learn what they want them to learn. Mm. And I sat there and thought, well, no, that's not right. If you're teaching in a racist community, you, you have to do something about racism. But I wanted to pass the course, so I did what we all did. I answered the questions the proper way, and I didn't challenge him. I guess you know that would never happen again to me, and it didn't happen after that. You have no right to allow children to come into your classroom as, and leave as racist as they came in. If you haven't made that change in your students, you haven't, you haven't lessened their degree of ignorance. You have contributed to their ignorance. Mm. I'm sorry. I tend to talk too much. I'm sorry. No, Go ahead. no, no. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You do you, Miss Jane. <laughs> You do you, because I want to let you know that on our show, we normally, you know, give people the opportunity to ask questions and things of that nature. But no one even has a question because you are literally just giving them all kind of knowledge, the kind of stuff that needs to be said, needs to be heard. And so, no, we, Brian and I, we do not have a problem with you, you know, talking. Trust me, this is this and, is just and, like... And Brian, when you said that you don't have the same kind of problem in England, 
Damn it all, Brian. That's where we got our slaves. That's where the people in the United States bought their slaves. They went to England to buy their slaves. And the Brit people in England, and I went to England in the town that was where the slave trade was the greatest several years ago to give a speech. And I'm speaking to these people who were ashamed of what they had done, but continue to do it, but in a more civilized manner. You cannot be racist in a civilized manner. That's because right. in order to be a racist, you have to de deny that they, you and I, are part of the same human race. And we have the right to be treated as civilized, whether or not we're the same. Just, just, I was just my, boggled my mind that they would ask me to speak there. Because right. I, knew what, I knew what it was about. And, and while I was there, I went for a walk in the park. And there were three white males, young white males, sitting on a bench. And they said, what are you here for, lady? And I said, well, I'm here to give a speech about racism. And then they went in, the three of them went in. Of course, they were all, they were real happy because they were, had some smokes that I didn't have. And they went into a, <laughs> oh, a lovely exp explanation for me of why I was wrong and why they know I'm wrong. And they used every, every nasty word you've ever heard. And I said, you know something? I think I'll go back from to where I came from because I don't want to be alone in this park with you boys. Uh. But I'll give you an I'll give you an example, a quick one. So my first career in the UK was advertising. Um, they were at, my boss was really really honest. Um, I was working for Saatchi and Saatchi, and then it was over to MNC Saatchi. They were more worried about me being an American than they were about my skin color. Uh -huh. My skin color didn't bother them. Now. I was the first person of color that they had ever, ever hired. And in the eight years that I was in the advertising, you know, we were traveling all over the world. I didn't see a brown or black person in a senior advertising position, whether it was on the United States side of the pond or the European side of the pond. But what I did is I paved the way forward for more people of color to become advertising executives. Now, fast forward 30 years, moved to Boston, looking for a similar post in advertising in Boston. So I have a bit of an accent. I know it's a little bit British. My name isn't ethnic, so I'm speaking to people on the phone. And they're, they're telling me, you're our number one candidate. The job is yours. Just come in for an interview. We want to meet you. Oh, let's come you. I'm sitting in the reception. And I'm the only person in the reception. It's not like there was anyone else. And the person coming out to interview is looking around. Mr. Yes. Mr. Sheffy, I'm like, yeah, that's me. And I could see it on their face. That job opportunity went up in smoke like that. But I still had to go through the pantomime of the interview. Uh -huh. But you don't sound black on the telephone. No. You don't sound black. And that I hear that. I hear that from somebody. But... But she didn't sound black. I didn't know she was black. She didn't sound black. Mm -hmm. Okay, now tell me what black sounds like. It's right. Just, it's, it's just, or the teacher who stands up in front of a group of students and says, I don't care whether you're black, brown, red, yellow, or green with purple polka dots. I'm going to treat you all alike. Mm -hmm. Now, those students have the right to say, only people who, the only people who are green with purple polka dots are from outer space. Are you lumping all people of color in with those who are from outer space? Not a day goes by when I work that a, some white woman, pale faced woman doesn't come up to me and say, I don't see color. And I think, Jane, don't do it. And then I think, go ahead. I say, well, I knew you didn't see color before you said it because if you didn't, if you saw color, you wouldn't wear that shirt with those pants. <laughs> now she takes exception to that. She gets really offended, and she goes racing away like, "Don't, don't go near that bitch." And I know she's going to call me bitch. Bitch doesn't bother me. For me, bitch is an acronym for being in total control, honey. Oh and wow! Oh, oh yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> it's the Let word me that write men, that one down. Write that one down because. When somebody calls me a bitch, I say to myself, and it's usually a male, it's usually a ma a tall white male who calls me a bitch looking down on me. And I say, you're out of control, aren't you, darling? Because he must be or he wouldn't be saying that. That's what he uses to control me. You can't control me with that because I consider it a com compliment. I say, you're out of control, aren't you, darling? But I can take care of that for you. And I re reach in my pocket and take out my little Lorena Bobbitt fruit knife. Now, I can take care of his anger if he really wants me to. <laughs> 
I don't have to, I don't have to, I don't have to accept that as the worst thing that anybody was ever called. Words are the most powerful weapon devised by humankind. We had better be careful about how we use them. And if yeah. you're going to use the B word with me, I'm going to know that you're out of control and that I have to control you. And I will, because I can. When somebody is in their child ego state, all I have to do is go into my parent ego state and keep them there. And that's what I do when I do the exercise. You just simply, the facilitator, the person who's doing the exercise simply has to be in their their parent their parent ego state. That forces everybody in the room to be in their child ego state. And it is absolutely remarkable. And then you realize when you've done that for hundreds, for 52 years, when you walk into the society today and see what's happening, or you watch television, you see what's happening, you realize that we are using the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise at the national level, at the federal level, but based on skin color instead of eye color. It's exactly what I do when I do the exercise. And it's exactly what Hitler did when one of the ways he decided who went into the gas chamber was eye color. I learned this exercise from Adolf Hitler. And I am so old that I remember he, he came to power the same year that Franklin Roosevelt came to power and the same year that I was born. I've been around too long. People will tell you that right away. Got to get that out of here. Yeah, well, I've been, along, I've been around too long and I've heard too much of this to not recognize what's going on in this country today. We're taking drastic steps backward and they've done studies that prove that the longer you stay in school, the more bigoted you become because the longer you stay in school, the more you are reinforced in what you learn K through eight. And that's exactly what we do. We reinforce the lies that we learned in from kindergarten to the eighth grade, we reinforce them from then on, and we're still doing it. We need to put a stop to it. Well, I've got a question for you in terms of specifically what's been going on since 2016. Well, actually, since Trayvon Martin. Let's let's just start with Trayvon Martin. No, let's start. Let, let's start with Barack Obama being a black man in the White House. I remember. I remember during the president during uh, anyway, it doesn't matter where it was a president standing up and saying to the group of white people, I'm trying to save the White House for you white people. Mm. This person who is now in the White House is there because of pale faces people's reaction to a black man in the White House. If you're gonna change this situation at all, the first thing you have to do is change the name of the White House to the president's residence because the White House sends the wrong message. The White House isn't just for white people. That is the president's residence. And that means that it can be a person of any color. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. My question to you was, what makes it easy or, easy or relatively easy for a large percentage of the, Amer the United States population to be indifferent? I can deal with the racist. I can deal with someone who's bigoted and prejudiced. I actually prefer it because I know where they're coming from. It's the indifference that always makes me really angry. How can people stand on the sideline watching groups, not just one group, whole groups of people being marginalized? I don't, I don't get it. Somebody has said the only thing necessary for the perpetuation of evil is for good people to do nothing. Mm. And when you are in a situation where, and believe me, I know, and so do you, I know what happens if you do something to fight the evil that is accepted by most of your peers. When you start to fight that evil, that evil is going to come down on you. People in this country do not, and, and oh my God, one of the teachers that was teaching in the same building that I was, in the elementary building, came to me after I had quit teaching to go to work with, quit, quit teaching children, quit start educating adults, came to me during a... So it wasn't just me that was affected negatively by that. It was the other teachers who didn't, who saw what was happening, who knew what was happening. The principal knew what was happening. They implored him to fire me, and he said, I won't fire her. And after, 
after I left there, the people who entered, the newspaper people, went to do stories about it. And they said, why didn't you fire her? And he said, because I knew she was right and I couldn't fire her for doing the right thing. Now, there are people in this country who are not indifferent, but if they want to keep their jobs, they want to keep their friends, they want to keep their golf partners, they want to keep their bridge club, they want to keep their acceptance in their community, they'll go along to get along. Adolf Hitler said, lucky the ruler whose subjects do not think. And that's what's going on in this country today. You best not think and you best not stand up and be counted. Because if you do, you become a target. I would rather be a target. I would rather lose my life than live a meaningless life. And if you know what's right and you don't do what's right, then as far as I'm concerned, you're living a meaningless life. I think people in this country are not indifferent. No, this isn't the result of indifference. This is the result of go along to get along and save yourself whatever it costs somebody else. Because after all, those people don't look like me, so why do I care? It isn't my fault they're like that. God made me the color I am because God wanted me to be on top of the heap. That kind of, in this country, as in every country, religion, is telling people how to behave. Unfortunately, we pick and choose from the Bible, just like we pick and choose out of the Constitution. We pick the things that will appeal to us and that aren't hard work, and those are the things we do. And we are rewarded for doing that by the other people who are doing the same thing. I don't think we're indifferent. Indifferent. I think we are, we have, we know how to protect ourselves. Um, I have, so there, finally, they wait to the very end. <laughs> it's, it's, it's two questions, but I think I can put them together. First, Kenyatta, she kind of went in, so I'm just going to read what she said, but let me finish everything. So she says, my question is, how many Jane Elliots are going to be left when we no longer have this awesome, wise lady? Does she have children? Or does she have a following of outspoken white people who will stop playing games and tell the truth and actually change the institution of racism? When will white people change what they started and perpetuate every day? I am tired of this. And I think this that actually goes with the other question um, as to saying, Jane, do you teach others to do this work? I've tried teaching others to do this work. And <laughs> I've tried to run classes here in my little redone church next to my house out in the country and only two people have been able to do the work because they say I'm not that mean I can't be that mean well if you can't be that mean you'd best not try to do what I do mm -hmm. number one number two I have four children three left but however three of my granddaughters would like to go into this work because mm -hmm. Because one of them has adopted a child who is half Hispanic, and he's absolutely the love of my life. One of them has a brother, and her brother is married to a black woman. And then I have two others who know that what I'm saying is right, and they want to make a difference. And they will eventually, probably within the next five years, go into this kind of work. But it will be difficult for them to get hired to do what I do, because what I do challenges the authority figures and most of the, no, not in companies, the people at the top of companies, and I've worked with a whole lot of companies, the people at the top of the company don't have the problem. It's the middle level people who have the problem. They've gotten where they want to be and they want to see to it that nobody replaces them. So the middle level people and the people at the bottom in corporations are the ones who have the problem. The people at the top have hired me to do the exercise. I work with U.S. West. U.S. West and Public Service, U.S. West Direct and Public Service of Colorado for three years. U.S. West literally changed the way their, their employees felt about the company and about the way they felt about other people after having three years of their employees going through the blue eyed, brown eyed exercise. If I could put the members of the Senate through the blue eyed, brown eyed exercise, <laughs> I could change the way they behave. I might not be able to change the way they think. But I could change the way they behave because I would let them see themselves as others. Who was it said? If some great power, the gift could give us to see ourselves as others see us. When you go through the exercise, you get to see yourself as others see you. And it is absolutely amazing the changes 
that take place in those white folks who thought they were all right until they watch themselves with the brown eyed people behaving the way white people behave all day, every day. And all of a sudden they see themselves as other people see them. It's absolutely fascinating to watch them go through it. Yeah. This is the perfect yeah. time for me to ask this question. Okay. Oh, are we back? Yep, this is the perfect time for me to ask this question. And Jane, you are the perfect person to ask this question too. Donnie and I get accused of being racist. And I just want on the record, can non-white people be racist? I think you can be angry about the racism that is visited upon you, but until you have the power to legislate that behavior, you can't be a racist. My without God, power, is there a way for me to cut this? Without <laughs> power, there is no such thing. Get mm -hmm. over it. When some person says to me, well, blacks can be racist too, and I say not without the power, to institutionalize their behaviors and their thoughts. Now, when people of color are writing the history books, you're going to see a different history. When people of color are writing the textbooks and, and when people of color are writing the math, math textbooks at the elementary level and some of the people in positions of power in those pictures are black males, then you can talk about racism. However, mm -hmm. within 30 years, white people will have become a numerical minority in the United States of America. Make no mistake about that. That's what the demographics of this country say, that within 30 years, white people will become have, will have become a minority in the United States of America. And that is one of the reasons why white people are so angry right now. They're scared to death that when, they, when people of color get power, they're going to want to treat us the way we have treated them. And invariably, is, yeah, go on. But this is the interesting thing, because Donnie and I have seen through our own research that if any groups of people have turned the other cheek in the yeah, Christian exactly. way that we're taught. It is brown, yellow, red. So that we can slap you on the other cheek. Yep, it's us. Yeah. Make no mistake about this. We say turn the other cheek so that you'll give up. No, don't turn the other cheek. Say no. You wouldn't like it if it happened to you, and I don't like it that it's happening to me. So I won't I'm tolerate it. Just gave Ellie, you B. Said, Ellie B. Sell said you must not tolerate the intolerable. I will not tolerate my pale face cousins doing to my cousins of other colors what they are doing now. I will not tolerate that. Just, just because they're a different skin color doesn't mean that they aren't my cousins. Every human being on the face of the earth is a 30th to 50th cousin of mine. And I will not have my darker skin cousins being mistreated because of the ignorance of my pale face cousins. I won't tolerate it. I don't have the right to do that. So my Auntie Jane, she just told y'all that I don't have to turn my uh, my cheek no more. I, nope. My Auntie Jane just told me that. So with that being said, I'm not I'm not turning my cheek no more. Nope. Uh, but but you, won't, say, you won't stop racism until you confront it. Yeah. So and I you just need to know, and you need to know that people who are saying, "Well, this business of Black Lives Matter, White Lives Matter too," I say, "Wait a minute." Black people, if you want to shut off that complaint, just add the word to, T-O-O, -O, to that statement. Black lives matter, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they don't, then they can't say, well, we are just talking about black lives. No, look at it. It says black lives matter, too. That means that we all matter, and we are all, if you trace our DNA back far enough, part of the black community. <laughs> that tickles me. That tickles me. I just wanted to quickly say this before the tweet storm starts and the <laughs> Facebook posts go. So I'm not saying that people of color can't be biased and that we can't be prejudiced. Those two things are very different than being racist. And it goes back to what Jane was saying. Words matter. But, but prejudice, prejudice is an emotional commitment to ignorance. Mm. It's on my shirt. I wear it in the airport, and I every time I wear shirt. it in the airport, some white male comes up and says, you're that blue-eyed, brown-eyed bitch, aren't you? I say, you're right about that. Yeah. I'm everything that you have just described me, but I'm not prejudiced just because you said that. I don't think you're stupid all over. I don't think you're stupid. I think you're ignorant. You can't fix stupid. You can fix ignorant with education. Somebody should have educated the man who says that to me. 
One minute. I want to ask you this one last question because the show is about to end. And this is from um, Karen Bertram. And she said, Jane, racism to me is connected with the control of resources, jobs, et cetera. Do you teach people that racism is, to some extent, the result of the haves trying to keep the have-nots disenfranchised so they can partake of, of resources? Clarence Thomas is a have. Hey, now. <laughs> And that's that. That answered that question. That's it. That's it. All you have to get is wealthy enough. But however, Nat King Cole couldn't walk into the restaurants in which he, the, the clubs in which he sang through the front door. He had to come in the back door. Which stopped him from doing it. Yes. He, and yeah. the actress, Hattie, Hattie, who played Mammy in um, Gone with the Wind. Right. I didn't realize that she could not go into the auditorium. No, she couldn't. She nope. couldn't go in. Nope, you see it, and it isn't, that isn't, that hasn't changed a whole lot. We know how to, well, you watch the movie with uh, Gregory Peck in it, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Yes. You, you watch that, and you see what happens in that novel, and then you realize that the woman who wrote it was a racist, and you realize that her next novel was, was even more slanted to the rightness of whiteness. And you watch Gregory Peck, the only person in town who will protect that black man until he couldn't anymore. And you think, oh, my God, this this tells you here's what's going to happen to you if you stand up for a black person. That's what that novel was all about, how to keep keep maintain a low profile mm. if you're going to be anti-racist. It's a lesson that we all learn. I haven't learned it yet. I refuse to learn that lesson. I am flunking that lesson. Amen. So, a women. Yeah. Don't say amen. Say a women. Mm. Go on. <laughs> a women. I got you. A women. <laughs> or a all. So <laughs> the hour has gotten away from us. We yeah. have only really just scratched the surface. But again, so so pleased to to find, to have you in the house, virtually yeah. speaking. Yeah. Virtually speaking, well, that's how people like to have me is virtually. I understand that. Perfect. No, fine. we wanted you. Well, God, we, if you would have, I don't even think I would have been able to control myself if you were sitting beside me. So this was probably <laughs> the best way right now because I love you so much and you have just given us such, just dropped so much knowledge on us and on our listeners and our followers and, um, this is going to, I'm going to make sure that you get a copy of this. So that I'd like to have, have it. Here's, here's something else your daughter has to do. Go to my website, jane at janeelliot.com. Download the printed language material, printed learning materials. The first is a set of typical statements that white folks make that think they aren't racist. She's heard every one of them. The yeah. second is a set of clarifications of those statements, how people who hear them are, are thinking about them. The third set is a set of commitments to combat racism. She should take, what how, What grade level is your daughter? My daughter's 27. She's 20. She That's needs to see this. And she needs to, I don't care how old you are, you need to see this. And she needs to take that group set of commitments, read through them, check yes, those that you have done, check no, those that you haven't done, then go back and circle one that you check no and decide to do it for a month. It will change the way you see your world and the people in it. And it will change the way people around you see you. And then she has to read every book on the bibliography, but particularly the Anthony Browder book. It's okay. absolutely essential. And the book that Nathan Rutstein wrote that is called Ending uh, the and it's get the Nathan get Nathan Rutstein's book about ending psychological genocide in the schools. That's the subtitle of the book. Ending psychological genocide in the schools. She has to read that book because then she'll realize that this is ignorance she's dealing with. And everybody ought to read The Myth of Race by Robert Wald Sussman because it says plainly and simply, if you don't want to read the whole thing, read the last page, the last two paragraphs of the last page, which says there's only one race on the face of the earth and we're all members of it. And we need to have that on license plates all over the United States. Welcome to my race, the human race. Well, you know what? My mom, that's how my mother raised me. Me and my sister and, and my two and my my brothers. I'm the youngest. And that's that she 
always and, told us she said there's only one race and that's the human race so and black out. mothers and black mothers can teach that to their kids until hell freezes over and, and they still have to pray that their black boys come home alive from the age of three to the age of 93. Mm. so unless you teach that to the whole population the fact that you know that that i know that isn't good enough we have to have education that is no longer indoctrination and that truly leads people out of ignorance because your mother wouldn't have had to teach you that if education had done its job. We've spent a lot of money on education in this country over the last 500 years, 240 some years. We've got, we've got a very, very poorly educated populace. And if you don't believe that, and if you really think indifference is the problem, you explain to me why we have a racist, sexist, ageist, homophobic, ethnocentric person in the White House. He didn't get there by, by, himself, by himself alone. That sounds like a good topic for part two. If you yeah, <laughs> so you're welcome to come back. <laughs> so Jane, thank you so much for sharing your Sunday with us. Everyone who's tuned in to, to view us online, thank you for sharing your Sunday with us. Next week, we're gonna be joined by Tiffany Huntsman, who's kind of at the intermediate stage of her research. So she's gonna be talking about some of the special kind of barriers and challenges that come with genealogist when you're at the intermediate stage. Yes. So I am Brian Sheffy. I'm Donya Williams. And thank you again, Miss Elliot, for just joining us. And you are more than welcome to come back whenever you want. If you just and want to say, I, Donya, I need to get something <laughs> off my chest. I'm like, okay. And then, you know, that will do that. <laughs> well, Not a I problem. Want to thank you. And I want to thank you for allowing me to vent my spleen yet again. Because I'm very really tired of this. I'm really, and I'm sorry for the kinds of emails that you're going to get. But you ask for it. Oh, we, oh, we get them. We get I'm them. Ready. We get them already. We get them already. I'm ready. Get them already. I'm ready. <laughs> and now you have told me I could turn. I don't have to turn my other cheek. They better watch out. No, 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 no. When you they get the hate mail, out. see, I, I had decided to write a book on the left page, the left side page. I was going to put a piece of hate mail. I was going to put on the right side of the page. I was going to put a piece of the, the mail that says they agree with me. And then I thought. You damn dummy, you're going to give these haters a platform in a book with your name on the front. Not going to do that. I just now I just put them in the I put them in the vertical file when I get them or I delete them on my email. Don't have to read it. And you don't have to put up with it either. Yes, ma'am. You don't have to call me ma'am either. It makes me look even older than I am. Thank you for calling me. I really appreciate it. OK, thank, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.